Good morning and welcome to the FSR Advanced Webinar entitled Decarbonization in the United States and in the European Union that will be today presented by Professor Daniel Ehrman, who is the director, director of the Climate Policy Research Unit at Loyola de Palacio Chair at the European University Institute. My name is Magdalena Mosh and I'm a training coordinator at Florence School of Regulation. And before we will connect today with our today's speaker, I would just like to point out a couple of issues regarding the webinar agenda. The first point is the introduction. So this is exactly what I'm doing right now. In this point, I will also explain briefly the control panel that you can see right now in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we'll be able to proceed uh, with the presentation of Danny Ellerman. Then there will be the Q&A section. In this section, our today's speaker will answer for the question submitted by the audience. And I will briefly explain how to submit your question in just a couple of seconds. In the last point, I will just conclude today's session with some final announcements. OK, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. There are a couple of issues that I would like to, uh, features that I would like to explain just right now. The first one is the, to open and to close the control panel. Uh, so if you would like to follow today's webinar on your full computer screen, you can just click here and the control panel will be minimized, but it will remain on your computer screen. However, if uh, during the webinar you would like to use uh, other features, you can always click in the same place and the control panel will reopen. The next button is to minimize the window. Therefore, if you would like to uh, do something on, the, um, on your computer or maybe check something on the internet, but you would still like to remain connected to the webinar, please click here and uh, you will remain connected to the webinar because the webinar icon will remain on the taskbar. Okay, and the button below is, to hand, is the hand rise tool. I would like you to use it right now. Uh, I, in this way, I will know that everything is fine and that we can proceed with the further sections of today's webinar. Therefore, if you can see my presentation right now on your computer screen, and if you can hear me, please click here, and I will know that everything is fine. I will just check uh, whether, how are you voting? I can see that you are doing this right now. Thank you very much. Uh, however, if you have any technical problems right now, or if you will have any technical problems during the webinar, please use the question box here below. This is also the place where you can submit questions uh, to our today's speaker, and he will answer for this question during the Q&A section. Uh, one very infor important information, I would like you to, uh, to submit only very brief questions, because in this way we will have more time to uh, to answer for as many questions as possible uh, in the Q&A. Okay, and right now arrives the time to connect with our today's speaker. So I would like to uh, unmute Danny right now. Danny, can you hear me? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Danny. Thank you very much for being with us today. I will right now connect to your computer screen. I am doing this right now, and in this way we will be able to proceed with your presentation. It will just take a couple of seconds. Perfect. I can see your presentation. And uh, so, therefore, I will leave you the floor, and I will connect back to you in around 43 minutes. So, good luck, Danny. Okay, thank you, Magda, and uh, welcome to all of you, all of the participants who are out there wherever you are. The motivation for this webinar can be described in one picture which raises one question. And here is the picture. This is, shows U.S. CO2 emissions from 1990 through 2011, that's the solid dots that you see uh, connected lines. And then it shows what has been the latest prediction of US CO2 emissions out through the year 2035. And this was contained in the 2012 Annual Energy Outlook that came from the US in, uh, Energy Information Administration. Now what's really striking about this is that you can see that from 1990 until about 2007, U.S. CO2 emissions rose by almost 20% from about 5 billion tons to a little bit over to just edging over 6 billion tons. Then they fell quite significantly during the recession. But what's really surprising is that the growth 
that had been known during the preceding two decades almost seems to have stopped, seems to have been flattened out. And if you look at the predictions now, uh, what we see is an expectation that it will be what would appear to be well beyond 2035, as far as they've gone in the predictions, before U.S. emissions would reach the peak that they'd achieved in uh, 2007, which was the last full year uh, before the recession. So this raises the question of how useful is climate policy in the case of the European Union, the EU ETS? And this question comes to mind especially because we believe there's very little in the way of climate policy in the United States, and in particular, there's no cap-and-trade program such as we observe in Europe. So let me now say how we're going to proceed. I'm going to focus mostly on explaining the decarbonization, or the predicted decarbonization in the United States. One can do this because the forecasts from the Energy Information Administration, the EIA, are enormously detailed, and they give a forecast every year. It's an annual event where they look forward 25, sometimes 30 years forward to see what they think will be the future. And we can compare, we can go back in the past years, these are all conveniently provided on their website to see just what people thought at some time back. Now, unfortunately, there's no comparable data or forecast for the European Union, however, I think looking and understanding what is behind the current forecast and how it has changed in the United States is instructive for similarities and differences with the European Union. And then finally, I'm going to come back to discuss climate policy and what difference it makes. So let's get started. But first, I want to pose a question to you before you hear anything else, which is, what do you think explains this change, this flattening of expected CO2 emissions? Now, you'll have four alternatives, and you may say that, well, it's all of the above or they're various mix, but I'm going to ask you to select the one which you think has the greatest influence or which is most important in explaining this predicted flattening of CO2 emissions in the United States. And the four alternatives are that energy and climate policy in the U.S. are in fact more effective than what it seems. The U.S. is in for a long period a long of slow economic growth or a long-term recession. There are low U.S. natural gas prices, about which I'm sure you've heard because of the shale gas revolution, or whether this is just hopeful thinking or forecasting. So I'm now going to open the poll uh, for this and uh, you can now uh, mark, you should now mark whichever one of those uh, you think is uh, most likely. And I'm seeing how many of you have voted, so we'll give this a little bit longer as you go forward uh, to see uh, what you all think uh, explains this flattening of the uh, emission forecast uh, in the United States. Okay, it seems to be coming to a close that all that are going to vote uh, have voted. Uh, so let me close the poll at this moment. We've got about, well, let's see, we're still getting some more, about two-thirds. Okay, let's close it here, and we'll see what the results are. Here, I'm showing those to you. So indeed, most of you have uh, indicated uh, low U.S. natural gas prices, uh, with 56% and 3% of a much slower economic growth. And you can see we have a minority who very few think that uh, climate policy is actually more effective and some that are attributing this to hopeful thinking and forecasting. So let's now I'm going to hide that and let's go on with the, uh, presen uh, the presentation. So. The most important thing, I'm going to show this graph over and over for various aspects of, of the prediction. And there's several things that you must note about it. It shows what has been the annual actual realized numbers for each of the successive forecasts. I'm starting with the forecast six years ago in 2006. And you can see with the blue line for 2006, the red line 2008, 
2010, and the latest, which has the X's on it. And of course, the last years for each of these forecasts are indicated uh, before. Now, notice that the horizontal axis is annually out to 2010, uh, and then it picks up in five-year intervals. These observations, in fact, a five-year interval. So that gives that sort of upward tilt as if you have sharply rising emissions, where in fact there's continuing out. But what I would ask you to keep in mind here is both, as we go through these, both what has been the change of forecast over this, these six years. And so you can see here, there's actually been a 30% reduction of expected emissions in 2030 in the last six years. Now, 2030 is the year at which we can compare all four forecasts. And from a period of what six years ago where one would have thought the levels being reached at six, million, six billion tons, as I'd mentioned before, uh, would emissions would continue rising and even reach eight billion tons by then. Now, one doesn't see the four billion, the six billion ton level being reached by 2030 or 2035 for that, for that amount. So if we want to get behind that prediction, a convenient way to do so is what can be called the Kaya decomposition, which is to observe that a change in CO2 emissions is the result of four variables. One, which is the change of population, and then three ratios that go with that. The first of those being the GDP per capita, or is roughly income per capita, how much it's changed. If there's more of it, we expect there'd be more CO2 emissions, just as greater population implies more CO2 emissions. Then it's the ratio of energy to GDP, which reflects the structure of production as well as energy endowments and energy prices at the time. And then finally, the CO2 intensity of the energy use in uh, the particular country or for the particular entity uh, that we're looking at. So you can see all of these cancel out. Uh, if you multiply, they're all multiplied together to give you the uh, change in CO2 emissions. So let's now look at these variables. And the first one is population. So here you can see what has been the actual growth of population steadily increasing over the years, somewhat over 300 million now, and predicted to continue increasing out through the forecast uh, periods. And you don't really see much change. In fact, the latest forecast sees slightly more people in 2030 than it did uh, six years ago. But this certainly doesn't explain the change of emissions. When we go to per capita GDP, and this is in constant dollars, I would remind you, you can see rising per capita GDP, some falling after the recession, but then predictions that it will increase uh, in the future and that we will be better off uh, in terms of having more uh, income in the future than we have now, but notice how much less over the period. So if we go to the forecast of six years ago, it's come down quite a lot in each of these three predictions. And now what's being predicted now is 19% less per capita GDP in 2030 than before. Now this is just a fact of the forecast we might question, why is this? Obviously, the recession has been part of it. The projection base in 2010 is virtually unchanged from what it was in 2004. Uh, but the really more important feature is the projected growth rate is now 25% lower at 1.6% per annum. That's per capita GDP versus what was a 2% 2.1% uh, predicted uh, as a little six years ago. And in fact, 89% of that difference that you saw in expected increase in per capita GDP growth is due to the slower GDP, expected GDP growth as it accumulates over the 25 to 30 years of the forecast. Okay, so that's one of the features, and several of you have picked that up in your estimate of what's the cause here. Let's go on to energy GDP. So you can see here, uh, energy efficiency is improving, uh, has been improving in the United States for a long time, as everywhere else. And you can see that the trend is expected to continue out through the forecast period. But no real changes here from before. It isn't expected that things are going to become more energy efficient, uh, or, or let's say significantly more than what we thought it was going to be uh, six years ago. It'll still be more energy efficient, of course. 
And then we come to the CO2 intensity. Now here, notice the vertical scale doesn't start at zero in order to sort of expand this and show you. But here you see quite a difference, an 11% decline in expected CO2 intensity. So if we go back six years ago, we can see that the expectation was that CO2 intensity of the economy would e become slightly greater than it had been uh, during the uh, first decade of the 21st century. And then progressively, that expectation has declined to where now you can see quite a remarkable predicted change or decline in the CO2 intensity of energy. So if we're to sum all of this up, when you take a 19% decline in per capita GDP plus an 11% decline in CO2 intensity, that fully accounts for the 30% drop of CO2 emissions uh, that we see in comparing these forecasts uh, looking out to 2030. And little change in expected population growth or in the energy efficiency of the American economy. Now, one might question, okay, those are the numbers, but what's behind them? How do we explain this? So first of all, I'd have to say that for the, these predictions are based upon a model, the, what is the Energy Information Administration's model, and GDP is given to that model. It's, it's an energy sector model. Uh, so what are the factors that we actually, uh, we could think are causing this uh, slowdown in GDP growth? Well, probably the most important is declining workforce participation. There has been quite a decline in that uh, because of the recession of people just being discouraged. But there are also sound reasons for believing that there'll be less labor inputs into the future. First of all, the baby boom generation is retiring, so that means more people leaving the workforce than are entering it. And there's some signs that the share of two-income households has reached its peak. And so that what had been that extra boost of extra labor inputs over the past uh, 20 to 30 years is at least leveling off and perhaps actually declining. There's probably declining productivity assumed in these forecasts and perhaps also less private investment. We don't really know, but there's a discussion on this and that's in another model. What we can track in the model and in the data that the EIA gives us is the causes of the change of CO2 intensity in energy use. So I wanna focus on that now. So we're gonna go through a rapid fire review of energy use uh, as, uh, as it's presented uh, in this uh, forecast. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to these charts. So here we get, if we look at total energy use, and again, you can see big change from what before had been that by 2030, we'd be at significantly some 30% higher energy use than what it had been in the 2010s. That's come down a lot in each successive forecast. And the forecast is still for somewhat higher energy use in 2030 and 2035 than what we experienced during the first decade of the century, uh, but certainly not much. And we can certainly attribute this seems to be quite clearly due to the reduction expected GDP. If we're to break this down into the different energy forms and we look first at petroleum products, liquid fuels, and other petroleum as it's called, we see the same thing from what had been expected much higher uh, use of, uh, of petroleum products to significant decline or reduction in the use of that because of the lower GDP. And note here, or at least certainly mostly due to that, and note here that the expectation is far from U.S. petroleum demand increasing over this period of time, as we thought six years ago, that it's going to be for the next 30 years, it's going to be, or 25 years, it's going to be lower than what had been known during the past uh, decade. That's quite a change in outlook uh, in terms of U.S. consumption of petroleum products. Coal, exactly the same sort of picture. Not the continuing increase of consumption as we thought as little as six years ago. And what we see here is pretty much a stable picture of, you know, of, of uh, coal use remaining pretty much the same as it has been in the past decade. Certainly not getting any greater. Again, this would seem logical given the reduction in expected GDP. And then if we move to natural gas, we really get a sort of confused picture here. Uh, this is, is very different. So keep in mind that 
you know, you, you can see sort of a really uncertainty about 2030, that actually in 2006 thought it'd be somewhere near 28 quads, then it drops, comes back, now it's back up there to work be a higher level than what was, what was thought before. Now all of this, which you can say here largely, this difference is despite the falling GDP. So there's clearly been seen an increased share of natural gas consumption that's taking place over this time and some uncertainty about just what it would be. But in the most recent forecast, certainly an increase over what had been the preceding uh, two. And finally, if we look at nuclear, hydro, and renewables, you can see the increase, gradual increase that generally is being observed, uh, but not much change here. In fact, the latest prediction being slightly less than what they thought before, uh, but uh, this is not there. Some increase over 2006. Uh, but not that much of a change uh, is what you've seen in the other pictures uh, that have been uh, presented. And one way to quickly summarize this is just look at the energy shares. So if we, this is showing, starting on your right, you can see the actual energy shares. Now it's petroleum, there are four columns, starting with petroleum, coal, natural gas, renewable energy, nuclear, and hydro. Uh, all classified turning to quads or to petajoules uh, of energy use. So you see the actual amount in 2005, then what was the predicted amount for 2030 as of 2006, that same amount as of 2008, 2010, 2012. So we can actually see, looking at this fixed point in the past, how expectations have changed. And if you look at 2006 prediction, you can see the general thought here is petroleum would maintain its 40% share, coal would be greater, natural gas less, and renewable nuclear and hydro less also. That was sort of reflecting the view that uh, there would be increasing coal use and natural gas prices would be rising. Then you can see how this changes over time. So we can see that as we move towards 2012, the share of petroleum shrinking, and then a view that the share of, of coal is shrinking, that we are now, in the latest forecast, would be much less, and commensurately, the share of natural gas recovering and becoming even greater, going over 25% of total energy use, and the same we observe for renewable uh, nuclear and hydro. So what we see, what is essentially behind this, is rising shares of low and no carbon energy forms from what had been 35% in 2005 to what now is expected to constitute 45% of energy use in 2030, according to this latest forecast. Now, we can zoom in on uh, electricity as well. This is an important sector. So here, if we look at electricity, You'll see a picture like you've seen before, the electricity, the expectation of electricity demand is falling with that falling GDP. Still expected to be some increase of electricity use compared to the present, but you can certainly see what's uh, happening here. Coal, of course, you already, most of the coal goes into the electricity sector, so no surprises here. Again, falling coal use to where it would be lower now than what it has been experienced in the past. It is expected to be lower than what had been experienced in the past a decade. In fact, a 40% reduction of expected coal use and power generation. And finally, if we go to natural gas, we can see again this sort of confused picture that despite electricity demand being down, you can see the variation here of people not being able quite to figure out the forecast for natural gas, but in the latest forecast, looking at that increase during the first decade of the century and pretty much projecting it on out through 2035 uh, in this uh, period here. And uh, corresponding to that 40% reduction of coal use, a 33% increase in expected natural gas use in power generation. And for the non-fossil use, uh, the same story. Not much change from what had been anticipated before, but a rising share. Of, of both uh, with respect to the current levels of use. And if we go back to the shares of electricity use, there's no petroleum use for all practical purposes in the electric utility sector, but here you see the same thing. And you can really see the change of outlook from what at which the future will hold more coal use and less natural gas use to a complete reverse of that, where the future will have less coal and more natural gas and also more renewable nuclear and hydro. So in this case, we see the low and no carbon energy forms, those being gas 
renewable nuclear and hydro going from 43% to 57% of electricity generation. Now, let's stop for a moment and ask a second question here. Why are we seeing these changing shares? Could it be climate policy? You may have heard there's uh, quite an aggressive, what the opponents sometimes refer to as anti-coal regulation coming out of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is leading to a lot of uh, shut down coal plants or at least announcements that they are gonna be shut down. Or is it the falling natural gas prices, uh, which are often referred to as the shale gas revolution in the United States? Or could it also be a rising price for coal? So I'm going to open, we're going to do this again, again, just as we had before, which is that uh, you are asked to pick which of, the, which of these four you think is the most important cause of the changing energy shares that you have seen. So I've now launched the poll. You can now indicate on your computers which you think, how much it's the Bavarian, uh, of, of which of these four possibilities uh, it is. Okay, I see the votes are mounting up here. We can go on for a few seconds more uh, as we go through here. Okay, well, we've got about three quarters of the vote in, so I'm going to close the poll at this point. Uh, and here you can see it. It was pretty overwhelming uh, view out there, which is that 75%, uh, it's lower gas prices that is driving these changing shares, with 11% of you seeing rate rising costs for coal, rising prices for coal, and smaller amounts, uh, regulatory actions, uh, and uh, actual climate policy. So let's go on. I'm now going to close that uh, poll, and we'll go back to the presentation. So here, I'm going to show you some graphs here on the prices that are behind. So I think now we want to look at uh, uh, behind these shares. What are the prices being assumed by the EIA forecasts. And here I'm showing we're taking a long view going back to 1975. Now the horizontal scale here is all equal in various years. And you can see the actual numbers through 2011. Now these are all in constant dollars. They're constant $2010 and it's dollars per million cubic feet, roughly a gigajoule. Uh, and then you can see the forecast from the four years that we have been using with the, the blue dots as being, or the little crosses being the latest forecast and these others being the earlier forecasts. And of course, you can see quite a series of ups and downs, generally upward trending for natural gas prices. Now these are, I'd also say, wellhead natural gas prices. So this is, this is what is effective of the shale gas rev revolution. Uh, and it's what's the price at which natural gas is coming into uh, the U.S. energy economy. And what you do see here is indeed that the latest forecast has seen uh, falling uh, natural gas prices or less of an increase. They're still expected to increase, not as much and at lower levels than what had been anticipated before. So that certainly would have some effect on energy shares. And generally 20, depending on the year, 20 to 30 percent lower real prices for, nat for natural gas than what had been expected uh, before. Now let's go to the crude oil price. This is the, what the EIA calls U.S. landed cost of crude oil imports, effectively the world price of oil. And you can see the picture of how those prices have evolved in the past. And here you see a real difference that although prices had gone up in the earlier forecast in 06 and 08, you can see the belief that oil prices would, although they had come up, they would stay more around the level of $50, $60 a barrel rather than the $20 a barrel level that they had reached for a long period uh, from the late 80s into the early uh, parts of the 21st century. But then that has really changed in the last four years. If we look at the 2010 forecast and now the 2012 forecast, you see oil prices going up significantly, expected in 2030 
to be something like $120 in today's dollars uh, per barrel, or roughly double what uh, they had been expected for. That's quite a large amount. And note here that this is at the same time the forecast is that natural gas prices in the United States will be lower. I'll come back to that point. And the final graph I want to show you is one that you won't see very often, which is sort of a long, this long view of U.S. coal prices. And the most remarkable feature here is this really significant decline in mine mouth, these are mine mouth, I repeat, coal prices in the United States from 1975 to the turn of the century, in which you saw a reduction of about two-thirds in the real cost of coal, enormous productivity improvements that were achieved in the coal industry during this time. And then in the last decade, that productivity improvement has reversed. I mean, this is the observed productivity. New mines are coming in, but a lot of that is reflecting the shift to metallurgical coal, responding to the steel demand coming out of China and the emerging economies, and also increased thermal coal demand. But those prices have clearly gone up. And you can see the, the expectations before in the earlier forecast, which is that, yes, they'd increase, but maybe they'd be a little bit higher than they were before, but basically coal prices were going to be flat. And the real change that you see here in 2012 is a belief that coal prices are going to be quite a bit higher in 2030 than, uh, say, they've been expected before. So if we just look at the 2030 numbers, you can see here it's a little bit below $30, and now it's expected to be up something like $47, $48 in 2010. So we're looking at prices, which again, depending on the year and the forecast being compared, are from a third to two thirds higher, let's say roughly 50% higher prices uh, for coal. So what I would ask you to retain here are two points. The first is that there is a significant projected increase of coal prices at the mine mouth, despite ample reserves and increased regulation, which is at the point of use, not at the mine. So what EPA has the sort of regulatory so-called anti-coal campaign it really affects the power plants and the points of use more than the mine. And the second is that U.S. natural gas prices are predicted to separate from world oil prices quite significantly. So in the past and in the 2006 forecast, the U.S. price of natural gas was expected to be something like 70% of the BTU equivalent uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the world oil price, whereas now it's expected to be something on the order of one-fourth of the world oil price. So this is quite a spread uh, between these two. And the real question, of course, is are these assumptions plausible? I would note to you that models are not neither right nor wrong. They simply crank out the numbers based upon the assumptions that are fed into them. And what you've seen here are what I would suggest the two most important assumptions uh, that explain the change, the predicted change in uh, U.S. CO2 emissions, namely the increase of coal prices, which also are helped by lower natural gas prices. But the real change here is in the coal price forecast and the fact that the belief that natural gas prices will not come together with world oil prices. That if we believe the world oil price forecast, uh, that you're going to have this island of extremely cheap uh, natural gas prices in the United States, and somehow those will not come together, either by oil prices coming down or U.S. natural gas prices increasing, perhaps due to exports. So what can we say? Let's now, enough with the United States, what can we say about uh, emissions uh, in the European Union? Well, the first thing, as I said before, there's no comparably coherent, objective, transparent projections for the EU through 2035. The European Environmental Agency in Copenhagen projects uh, the 2020 emissions, uh, but it's mostly based on member state projections. And their projection is that they'll achieve the 20% reduction targets uh, from 20, 2005 emissions will be achieved by 2020 with existing measures. Uh, there is, however, the U.S. Energy Information Administration does make international projections. It's with a different model and it's not as detailed as the one used for the U.S. projections. And the latest one of these is what's called the International Energy Outlook for 2011. So this does give us a means to, within a single model, compare the U.S. and Europe. However, 
they don't look at the European Union, they look at what they call OECD Europe, which includes Turkey and excludes Romania, Bulgaria, and the Baltic. Still, the bulk of it is there. So for what it's worth, you can see this is the view of US and OECD Europe emissions as they're predicted in 2011. And you'll see lower emissions in the EU or in OECD Europe uh, than in the US, but not by a whole lot. So it's like 4% lower than the 2006 level, which is the base year for this particular forecast, uh, versus something like 7% higher in the United States. So, you know, a 10% difference in the evolution there, but uh, not that uh, big of a difference. And we can actually take these and go back through, do a Kaya decomposition of these projections for the two entities. And so we can see that the prediction for the U.S. is 0.3% annual growth uh, versus slight reduction minus 0.08% per annum, OECD Europe. Population growing, uh, you know, about two-thirds of a percentage uh, point more in the United States uh, than in OECD Europe. Uh, per capita income growing, predicted to grow exactly at the same levels. But then note on energy and CO2 use, uh, more improvement of energy efficiency, predicted improvement of energy efficiency in the U.S. than OECD Europe, uh, perhaps reflecting more room for energy efficiency uh, and but a different story with respect to the CO2 intensity. Although I would note that if you put those latter two together, you're getting a bigger decrease in CO2 emissions per unit per capita uh, emissions or for the GDP growth uh, than you are in Europe, which is actually even then predicting greater decarbonization in the U.S. than in OECD Europe. And U.S. emissions are higher only because of the greater population growth. I'd also have to say it's not clear what climate policies are assumed in effect in the EU in this forecast, although typically they take whatever's in place is considered to be, the, be what's there. Let's turn now to U.S. and EU climate policy. And let me try to characterize it here very briefly. I think EU climate policy, of course, is the famous 2020-20 by 2020. Uh, but I think the key elements to retain are you have the emission trading system, sometimes called the flagship, uh, which whose most important component, I would argue, is the 1.74% annually declining EU-wide cap and the common price throughout Europe. Highly centralized or non-differentiated system as far as the member states are concerned. Then they're mandatory, meaning that they're legally binding within EU law upon the member states, uh, renewable energy targets summing to 20% of total energy with varying member state implementation incentives. So highly decentralized here opposed to the ETS, which has this non-differentiated uh, effect across the whole European economic space. And then we have what are presently aspirational, but perhaps mandatory 20% energy efficiency improvement over the time, same time horizon. Well, what about the United States? So there is, there will be an emission trading system in California starting uh, with 2013. Uh, and there's been one in the Northeastern US in the so-called REGI or Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative states uh, since 2009. However, in the latter, the price is only $2 a, a ton, and that's because of the floor price on the auctions, and essentially it reflects the fact that the cap was massively overallocated. Only a, a third to a half of the auction of the allowances available auction are actually taken up in the auction. So you have real overallocation in that. That's being reconsidered, and they're talking about tightening it, but we still have to see how that goes. There's also, and perhaps this is, a, is probably the most important incentive in the United States, the two cents per kilowatt hour or $20 per megawatt hour production tax credit for new renewable energy, and for that matter of fact, new nuclear, of which there's none. Uh, but this incentive is expected to expire at the end of this year and no longer to be available in 2013. Now, that's certainly still open uh, to decision, and, uh, but uh, the expectation now is it will not continue because of the budget pressures. There are varying state renewable energy standards of varying stringency and various uh, degrees of enforceability. There's also very aggressive automobile fuel efficiency standards, which will double the fuel efficiency of new vehicles by 2025 that was recently adopted 
by the um, Obama administration. And finally, the so-called anti-coal regulatory program at uh, EPA. So here we see in a nutshell what sort of the 2020-20 versus this conjuries of, of policies that we can see in the United States. So as a final poll in our webinar today, I'm gonna to ask you to pick one of these statements and I'm gonna ask you to, to vote here on which in which statement you would have the greatest confidence, and that is that U.S. emissions will remain below 2005 levels through 2035, or whether the EU ETS emissions, that is the emissions within the trading system, will be 20% below 2005 level in 2020, or whether the various non-ETS objectives of the EU 2020 package will be met, and that's the renewable, the energy efficiency, and also the effort share burden for the non-ETS sectors. So let's go back to our polls. I'm gonna now open this poll and give you a chance. So here I've launched it. You can now cast your vote. There are only three here. And so I'm gonna ask you to say, which of these do you have the greatest confidence in? Or do you feel most confident that we'll actually see occur. Okay, so we're progressing along here uh, in the votes. Uh, as usual, we don't have everybody voting, but we're having a good number and it's starting to slow down here. Let's uh, go up. Okay, we've got about three quarters have now voted, so I'm going to close the poll and here you can see the results as I see them and uh, we have certainly, the bulk of you, two-thirds, think have greater confidence in ETS emissions being 20% below the level than, uh, than you do in the other propositions, and that's followed by belief that the U.S. emissions will below, and the least confidence in the non-ETS objectives of the 2020 uh, uh, will be met. So I'm gonna hide that now, that's the end of the polling, and let's now wrap up. I'll actually give you my ranking here. I actually voted, or I vote, but I actually put a rank. I would agree, I mean, all of you agreed with me that ETS emissions will be 20% below the 2005 levels in 2020. I guess I have a little more confidence in the 2020 package will be met than I do that U.S. emissions will remain below the 2005 levels through 2035, essentially because of the uh, two assumptions that I place to you. However, uh, and let's, at this point, let's, let me come back to what I think is the value of climate policy. Uh, so first of all, the future is always uncertain. So we don't know what these energy prices are going to be out over that, that period of time. It's also true that no policy is immutable. So whatever the climate policy is today doesn't mean it's going to change. It, it it's cannot be changed over the sort of horizons that we're talking about, and maybe it would be made looser rather than tighter. For instance, if the cap is retained, will it decline at a lower rate, or is it going to be even a, a tighter rate? But what I would argue the value of policies is they create stronger presumptions about future emission levels than others, or about uh, that once a policy is in place and it's actually been implemented, it has inertia working in its fashion, and then particularly when we're talking about emission levels, as we have been here, uh, a cap creates stronger presumptions with respect to those emissions. It seems all of you indeed agree with that, that the cap will provide more assurance on emission levels, but of course not the price, as we well know. So to sum up here, I don't want to leave you with the notion that the predicted U.S. decarbonization is impossible. It is, as many of you thought, seem to have actually had more confidence in that than, than I do, uh, that, uh, but it certainly could occur. But it rests upon some arguable assumptions, and a lot can change between now and, and 2035. Our forecasts, as you saw six years ago, weren't all that, have changed quite a bit, so it's quite possible they could change as much uh, in the future. And what climate policy does is to make decarbonization in the EU far more certain than it will be than what the predictions uh, now would have for the United States. That whatever happens, 
we can be reasonably confident that EU CO2 emissions will decline out over this horizon. And the same simply cannot be said for the United States. So I want to thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to receive and answer your questions in the time we have remaining. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your excellent presentation. And right now we can proceed to the Q&A. There were a couple of questions submitted already by our audience. And I would like to just uh, tell to all of you that if you want to uh, submit maybe more questions, you can do it right now. Uh, the first question is, uh, the change in emissions forecast is pretty impressive. And it makes one wonder what the forecast will be six years from now. Could, be, could it be back to where it was six years ago? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I certainly left that open. I don't think that will be the case because I think we are in for a period of slower economic growth, both for the demographic reasons that I mentioned and because of the deleveraging that we're seeing throughout the economy of household budgets, corporations, governments, all. Uh, it's not going to be the, we've gone through a period in the past few decades of, uh, I, I think, higher than usual growth uh, for uh, the reasons that I've adduced. Uh, I do think there's a lot less certainty about energy prices, whether uh, I'm not a complete believer in the shale gas revolution, uh, but uh, we'll just have to see. It is pretty impressive uh, nonetheless, and uh, I think those are the things that can change uh, far more uh, than, uh, than the forces behind GDP growth. Okay, the next question will be, do you know why domestic coal price is going up? I'm puzzled by that. Uh, there certainly has been rising cost uh, and, and depletion in certain regions of the U.S., particularly in Appalachia. So mountaintop, the reserves are being depleted, and one could argue that this would put some upward pressure on prices. But for most of the United States, and particularly in the Midwest, and if you go to the far west and the Powder River Basin, the major producing basins, uh, it's hard to think that uh, there's any resource constraints that are operative that are on the East Coast with the, uh, in some of the Appalachian coal. And I'm also, I have a hard time believing that the uh, sort of declining productivity or that productivity won't continue to improve over time, that somehow we've come to the end of productivity improvements. Uh, so I, that's, the, that's the biggest surprise to me as I went into preparing for this webinar and explaining this forecast that uh, their coal mine mouth price uh, prediction. I would have been less surprised if it had been like the cost of coal at the power plants would be higher because of environmental regulation, but typically that would depress the price of coal prices. But here they really have at the mine mouth that it's going to increase, and I guess I'm, I have a lot more question about that. Okay, the third question is, is the carbonization in U.S. also higher in real terms or only in percentage terms? The decarbonization, I guess here I think of, of higher, I think it is, is, is it, it is in real terms. I mean, the prediction, if we think of what the CO2 emission forecasts are, that we will not exceed. Remember, the U.S. exceeded 6 billion tons in 2007. And that latest forecast is that that figure will not be seen until uh, after 2035. Uh, so I think those are real. That's not just a, a share. I mean, I went through a lot of this in terms of the shares. You can see how it's the shifting shares of energy use and the reduced energy use because of less GDP growth that largely accounts, accounts for it. Okay, so the next question is, do you expect some reconvergence of gas and oil due to substitution over time? And here's the example, is the ex uh, for instance, is the expected long-term divergence wrong? I think it is, yes. I, that, uh, as you astutely noticed, whoever posed that question, uh, that's one of the major assumptions that I see there. Uh, how that will happen uh, is less certain, but I just, you know, export terminals are now being permitted and actually built in the United States because people see the difference between gas prices in Europe and in Asia 
and the gas prices in the U.S. and see a huge potential for profit. Uh, so now there's a lot of domestic opposition to exporting natural gas, of course, uh, but uh, whether it can stop that uh, it is not clear. So I think we, we are going to see that, that convergence over time. It, it'd really be unusual. Now that's not to say that there will not always be some sort of divergence between the gas prices always be typically lower than, uh, than oil prices. I think the sort of parity that natural LNG producers and natural gas producers and the Russians, for instance, always seek is a thing of the past. And uh, we'll see increasingly gas on gas competition that will keep gas below whatever the, uh, the oil price is and drive oil out of the industrial sector, much as it has in the U.S. I mean, oil petroleum products are strictly a transportation fuel in the U.S. It's hardly used in the industrial sector and not at all in electric utilities. The next question is, how much does the progress in developing existing and new te energy technologies in energy account for in the forecast? That's, I don't have the exact numbers. They could be derived from the figures that I gave there. You'll notice that in the forecast for renewable uh, nuclear and hydro, quite a jump. I mean, if you look at natural gas use over the past 10 years, it has been increasing pretty steadily in, in both in absolute terms and share terms in the United States and in, in the electric utility sector. You'll see that graph that showed the renewable energy hydro and nuclear has, has been pretty flat for the past 10 years. Of course, picking up some, but then a big increase anticipated. And this is reflecting the expected. This is mostly all renewable energy. It's the wind energy, uh, primarily wind. Uh, there has been, there is some projected increases of nuclear which are brought into question, but there's virtually no new hydro. And I would submit that over time, we won't see the nuclear development. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we probably will see some of the wind development. There's been quite a bit already uh, put in place. Uh, but uh, that, too, perhaps uh, can be questioned. Well, we are running out of time, unfortunately. So now it's time for the last question uh, in today's Q&A. The question will be, what do you think would happen if shale gas came to be developed in Europe? Well, the basic lesson here is, the first point is, it would not reduce expected emissions, uh, at least within the, within the ETS, within the emission trading system. It would tend to push prices lower because, of course, you don't need a higher price to push out coal. The lower gas price will do that. And whether you have, I mean, it's a big debate as whether you would see shale gas in the European Union, but I would note that the shale gas phenomena in the United States, not to mention if it spreads elsewhere in the world other than Europe, will have distinct effects upon Europe in that all the LNG supplies, the liquefied natural gas supplies have been developed for the U.S. market or for the Chinese market and others, will now come, uh, will be seeking a home in Europe, and that's going to bring natural gas prices in Europe down from their current levels. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, let me just say that if there is anyone in our audience who would like to contact you uh, directly after today's webinar, uh, there is an email right now, your email address uh, on the screen, so they can contact you directly later on. Uh, but for now, I will have to say, unfortunately, goodbye, Danny. <laughs> thank okay, you very much goodbye. for being with us today. And thank you thank very you. much for hosting us. Thank you very much for, for being with us. It was a pleasure to host you in FSR webinars. So right now, unfortunately, I have to mute you and I will, uh, I will conclude our uh, today's session. So goodbye, Danny. Okay, goodbye, everybody. And right now, I will just briefly come back to my computer screen. I am doing this right now. It will just take a few seconds. Okay, so right now you can see my presentation once again. Uh, so let me just conclude today's session with some final announcements. The first announcement is that right after I will close our today's webinar, automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. This survey is always the same for every our webinar and is consisted of eight questions. I really uh, would appreciate if you could fill it out because this will help us to evaluate today's session and also make some improvements in our future webinars.
The next announcement is that on Friday you will receive a follow-up email from me uh, in which I will uh, thank you for participating in our today's webinar and also now uh, I will answer for a question from uh, that many of you have asked me during the webinar that it will be possible to download the PDF from today's presentation and also watch the recording from today's webinar and in the follow-up email you will find the link uh, to our webinar archive website uh, where on Friday the recording will be uploaded together with the PDF. It will be also possible to watch the recording on the FSR YouTube channel. In this email, you will also find a uh, new link to register for the next webinar. And the next webinar will take place on the 20th of November, always at 11 a.m. And this time, we will tackle an issue of smart grids. And the presenters of this uh, webinar will be Pablo Frias and Ignacio Perez Ariaga. Pablo Frias is assistant professor at Comilas University, and Ignacio Perez Ariaga is a professor at the Comilas University and the director of FSR Energy Training. Uh, therefore, if you would like to participate in this webinar, you can register for it um, right after you receive the follow-up email, or you can go right now to our um, website. And this is the view of our website yesterday. Today, this part is already updated right now. Uh, so if you click here, you will be able to uh, register for the next webinar. However, if you would like to check maybe some other trainings organized here at Florence School of Regulation, just go uh, to the training section on our website. Or you can always contact me directly by using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. However, if you have any questions regarding uh, today's webinar, regarding the content of today's webinar, you can contact Denny uh, using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. Okay, so it's time to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you will do it once again uh, in our future webinars. Until then, I would like to wish you a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.